to Ephesians and please stand as we read. Ephesians 5, we'll read from verses 15 to 21. Therefore, look carefully as you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for this that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Please be seated. The key to understanding this passage uh, is the emphasis that's mentioned about two or three times uh, like in verse 10, when Paul says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And then he repeats that in verse 15, says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And then it says in verse 17, do not be foolish, but what? Understand what the will of the Lord is. So again, verse um, 10, learn what pleases God. Verse 15, be careful how you walk. Verse 17, understand what the will of the Lord is. That's three different ways of saying the exact same thing. And that same thing is you need to make it a goal in your life to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis what pleases God. Now the word acceptable there, it also refers to like a religious worship. And so what he's really saying is, pleasing God is ultimately being worshipful to Him. And I want to start off by kind of clarifying certain things uh, before we jump in. You know, when people talk about wanting to please God, immediately they think about being a law keeper, keeping the law. Now, we're all for keeping the law, whether it be the laws of this land or the laws of the Scripture. Now, we're, we are talking about the laws of Scripture, but... but the Bible does say, you know, things like, you know, submit to the government. You know, things like when there's a stop sign, you're supposed to come to a complete what? Stop, you know. Uh, and, and so things like that. We, but, you know, but what happens so often is people use laws not for the purpose of worshiping God, but for the purpose of self-esteem. They obey the law to make themselves feel better. Sometimes, even with the scripture, they keep it strictly. You know, things like don't break the Sabbath. And some of them will actually come up with this ridiculous application of saying things like, yeah, on Sunday, which is our Christian Sabbath, I don't even put in gas. And so they apply that. They try to strictly keep the law. But the Bible says these are what the religious leaders did, and they're called hypocrites. Meaning, they wanted to obey the law thinking they will be acceptable before God, but they did it at the expense of everyone else suffering. There was no visible love in them. They saw it more like a competition. I'm going to keep this. Let's see if you can. And they would condemn others for not being able to keep the law like they did on the outside. Now turn with me to Matthew 22 for a moment. There's a... A lot of discussion, um, you know, in the Christian circle about antinomianism. Uh, that's another fancy word of saying things like no law. Christianity is not about the law. It's about love. But you need to understand, uh, keeping the law is God's will. Okay, But he clarifies it like this. Look at chapter 22, verse 35. Chapter 22, verse 35 and it says, one of them, a scholar of the law, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And I think some of your translation would even say, what is the greatest law? Of all the laws in the Old Testament, which one is the most important? And Jesus said to him, obviously because he's the one who wrote it, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, the religious leaders thought that the least law in the Old Testament was do not boil a mother in her own milk or no, boil her young in her own milk, something like that, like a bird. Maybe he, he, he was thinking like that. Which one of these, if you had to prioritize in your order, which one is the most greatest one? And Jesus said it's loving God and loving people. But look how he clarifies in verse 40. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the what? The prophets. That's another way of saying every single law I gave to you is all about loving God and loving what? People. So if you are a law keeper, you should technically be, theoretically, the most loving person on the face of this planet. Every Old, Old Testament law given to Israel was all about honoring God and loving what? Others. You know, law, laws like if you see your neighbor's ox in a pit, go and bring it what? Out and take it back to the neighbor. It's an act of what? Love. But if you become a law keeper, but not grow in love, you are now a legalist. Someone who's doing it purely for the sake of your own self-esteem that you might feel spiritual for your own sake. Okay. Now going back to Ephesians, we're talking about pleasing God. Okay. That's what Paul wants you to learn to do. Learn to please God. Trying to learn to please God. That phrase is referring to your daily act. Every single moment you're trying to figure out, is this pleasing to God or not? And so keeping the law is part of that. And you'll see uh, in, in, when we get into the, the meat of this text, that without the principles of the law, it is impossible to discern what actually pleases Him. But we want to please the Lord. We want to learn to please the Lord. Now, just as a review, we also learned uh, several weeks ago that believing in God is actually an act of obedience. It's not a mental assent of saying, yes, I believe in you know, UFOs. I, I will accept that fact. It's not that. Obedience to God is revealed by faith. Notice, it says in verse... Um, 14, for this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This was a song that they sang at that time, but notice the command. He's telling the sinner who's in darkness, who's dead, Wake up and rise up. It's a command. You need to believe. So our first act of obedience is actually faith. It's an act of submission. Another thing that we've learned, and this is where we ended up last time we were together, was on the issue of time. The submission of time to God. Okay, Verse 15, Therefore be careful, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Verse 16, Redeeming the time. Kairos. Because the days are evil. The word time there is not chronos. Chronos has to do with a sequential events of time going one, two, three, four, five. He's talking about kairos, an epic, a set time given to you. Every one of us is given a set time to live on earth. Once that time comes up to uh, uh, up to up to pass, then we're we're going to die. We're, we're done in our time. And Paul is saying you only have a limited time. You cannot extend that time. But whatever time you have, you must use it for the glory of God and not waste it. Now, we, we clarified, and this was what, what I was trying to really bring to conviction in your heart, that time can become an idol. Okay, Time can become an idol. You are greedy for your what? Your time. Your gain your pleasure, 
your time. And if you ever get angry at someone for intruding on your time, you are an idolater. Your anger reveals that you covet your own time. Uh, you know, again, uh, with, when John Piper spoke at the Shepherds Conference uh, on Providence, he was making it clear God interrupts what we do all under His plan to help you grow, to weaken your pride, to cause you to hate sin. And these disruptions are not pleasant. You can be either in famine, persecution. You might be debilitated physically. You will see people get upset and angry at God. You took my leg. And they shake their fist and, and, and just in horror, they're cursing God. You want to go to this and then something happens and you can't go anymore. You want to do this and then someone in truth and say, oh, but this happened. And you go, oh, I'm so frustrated. You are being greedy for time. And the Bible calls all of those who are greedy idolaters, verse 5. For this you know with certainty that no one, ex no one who is sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Never ever say, this is my time. Say it's the, get used to saying, this is the time God has allotted to me. And sometimes we plan things out, and if there's an interruption, we must realize that is the sovereign providence of God. Now, for the most part, though, our error is not that. We're not even planning to use it rightly. Uh, we're, most, we're probably more guilty of misuse of our time, wasting time, or not making most of the time. We just let time you know, pass by, and we have no guilt. But today, you need to feel guilty. You need to start feeling guilty by wasting that time that God has given to you. Every second is a gift of God, the grace and mercy of God to do His work. And that's part of learning to please the Lord. And the perspective, if you look at the end of verse 16, is that the days are evil. Okay, The days are evil. The time of these days are evil. Um, we live in evil days. Time is spent sinning by people. Greedily searching for pleasure, for riches, for material possessions, for self-esteem, everything but the Lord. And we must not walk like them. Now let's go through this outline again, and then we'll jump into verse 17. Um, it's all about walking worthy, but I'm not going to start in chapter 4, verse 1. We'll just start from verse 17. The practical way of walking worthy starts in verse 17 all the way to the end of this letter. How do we walk worthy on the practical level? Number one, we need a new mindset. And that's verses 17 to 19. And then we need a new lifestyle, verses 22 to 31. And starting from chapter 5, verses 1 through 21, where we're trying to end up today, is a new attitude. Okay, Practically, to walk worthy, we need new attitudes. An attitude of love, verses 1 through 2. An attitude of purity, verses 3 to 6. An attitude of separation from the world, verse 7 through 13. And fourthly, and lastly, an attitude of submission. That's found in verses 14 to 21, okay? An attitude of submission. Everything that you find in verses 14 to 21 is all about submitting. You need to be good at submitting. And we're not, we haven't even got to verse 22 with wives submit to your own husbands. And notice that verse 21, before the wives are told to submit, everyone is told to what? Submit, verse 21. It says, be subject to one another. That's talking about every single person in the church. Everyone is to be in a submissive attitude toward one another. 
So it's all about submission. Okay? Submission in five areas. Submission, I'm sorry, three areas. Submission in faith, believing. Submission of your time, verses 15 and 16. And thirdly, submission to the Holy Spirit. And that's in verses 17 to 21. And there are five sub-points to that as well. How do you submit to the Holy Spirit? From verses 17 to 21, you have five commands. Number one, you submit to the Spirit by knowing His will. The Holy Spirit is commanding you, know His will. Number two, verse 18, yield to Him. Yield to Him. When it says be filled with the Spirit of God, He's saying yield. Yield to the Spirit of God. Verse 19, rejoice in Him. Rejoice is a command. Being happy is being submissive. Have you ever thought about that? When you wake up and you rejoice throughout the day, you are actually walking in submission to the Spirit of God. When you refuse to rejoice, you are refusing to submit to the Spirit of God. See, this will go against people who claim that they're depressed. That there is genuine sadness and sorrow when someone dies. You obviously are not going to be rejoicing. There's grieving. There's mourning. A time to mourn. A time to weep. Right? A time to, time to just bow your head and, and, and be silent. But there is nothing in the scripture that says you can be depressed for months on end. Depression is really you refusing to what? Rejoice. To such an extent that you now feel that the, that the medical examiner, a psychiatrist who has an MD, PhD, can now prescribe a medicine to you because it is purely what? Physiological now. It is no longer mental. When they say mental illness, what they're really saying is there's something wrong with the chemical balance of the brain and your body. The Bible says you must rejoice. Look at verse 19. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. You can summarize that by saying rejoice. Rejoice. Be happy. Sing. In verse 20, be thankful. Be thankful, always giving thanks, always giving thanks. You know, when I went up there to the mountains with Daisy today, I just kept thanking the Lord. But when she started to slow down, I stopped thanking the Lord. Actually, I was kind of thanking Him and saying, maybe now is the time for a new dog. Thank you, Lord, for making it clear. Okay, But I try to make it a goal in my life to be thankful for everything. Anything, anything pleasant, immediate thanks. Thank God I got home safely. Thank God for the little breeze that I felt in the air when I was outside working. Thankful for my coffee. Everything. You want to be thankful always. Because that is a submission to the what? Spirit of God. And lastly, verse 21, submitting to each other. Now, I already finished the message. Now, let's just do the end here, right? But we need to get into the particulars now. Look at verse 17. Submit to the Spirit of God. How? Know His will. Look at verse 17. On account of this, do not be foolish. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Do not be foolish. Now, if you want to make that even stronger, it's basically saying, do not be dumb. Okay? And for the children's sake, I will say the S word, S-T-O-O-P-I-D, okay? <laughs> right? Don't be foolish. Now, you have to understand, actually, the word foolishness is actually stronger than the word stupid. But I guess when they hear that in today's culture, they think, oh, foolish doesn't mean as strong. But it is a strong word. And the Spirit of God is saying, stop. You know why? Foolishness is equivalent to rebellion. 
The Bible never ever allows anyone to say, be foolish. It condemns folly. The purpose in our life is to do what? Please the Lord, to carefully walk in our life, to reform our ways. And this actually becomes the clearest test of a true believer. Professing believers who are not actually saved will on the outside look spiritual when people are watching. But when no one is watching, they will still strive, true believers, to please and honor God and not be fools. True believers will examine their ways because they truly want to worship God and be pleasing and acceptable. The word foolish, what does that mean? It's a lack of prudence or good judgment, ignorant, senseless, without reflection or acting rashly. But if you really want to see what God thinks of foolishness, turn with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 22. Here, it clearly indicates that folly, foolishness, is in God's eyes rebellion against Him. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 22. He says, For my people, talking, to, talking about Israel, my people are fools. They know me not. They are Okay, this is from the NASB. They are stupid children. It says it right there in the Bible. Now I can say it. Okay, And they have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. Okay, They're doing evil. That's rebellion. Fool, being a fool does not mean that you just don't get it. It doesn't mean that you, you're prone to make a lot of mistakes. A fool is someone who just won't take the time to understand what God wants of you and to do that which what God wants of you to do. There's so many verses in the Old Testament. Here's a few on being a fool, like Proverbs 1 verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and what? Instruction. Do you guys hear the word rebelling in there? It's there. When you despise wisdom and instruction, what is that? It's a contrarian. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to do what you're telling me to what? Do. The wise receive instruction. Why? The wise want to submit to Christ. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. And if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9, let's read that together. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. After Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. It says, Do not be eager in your spirit to be vexed. Now, that's the LSB version. The NASB says, Do not be eager in your heart to be what? Angry. Don't be quick to anger. Why? Anger resides in the bosom of fools. There's nothing righteous or good about being a fool. A fool is equivalent to a rebellious sinner who reveals itself when he's angry. If you find yourself getting angry quickly, understand you are a fool. You lose your temper, you are a what? A fool. You can't just say, well, it's just immaturity. No. It's an act of rebellion against God. It's an, it is an attack against God. You are shaking your fist and saying, God, I will not do what you want me to do. I'm content to walk this way. And God says, you fool! 
Don't be a fool. And that's what Paul is saying. Do not be foolish. Being foolish is one who does not know the will of God or does not seek to know the will of God and ultimately will waste time in foolishness. Now, the scripture depicts ways in which you can be foolish. Like, if you go back with me to Ephesians, he's already given several examples of folly. Rebelliousness against God and folly. In Ephesians, one practical depiction of foolishness is obviously wasting of time. Okay? Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, verse 15. And verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Another way of depicting, uh, depicting foolishness in, is found in verse 18. Do not get what? Don't get drunk. When a person gets drunk, it is really an epitome of foolishness. How did you get to that point of letting yourself lose complete what? control and act like a just a fool bitterness if you look at uh, chapter 4 verse 31 let all bitterness and anger and wrath and slander and shouting be put away from you along with all what malice when you become anything like this you are revealing foolishness by the way, the world, if you think about it, Christians, we're trying to fight this fleshly desire of being bitter, angry, wrathful, slandering, right? But can you imagine what it's like for an unbeliever? You know what you have to realize? For unbelievers, never ever assume they're thinking positively of you. Because this verse is saying to Christians, put that sin away from you because you're now in Christ, right? So that means those who are not indwelt with the Spirit of God, you know what they're always going to be doing? They're always going to be bitter. They're always going to be angry. They're always in wrath, shouting. They're slandering. And they always have malice. They will always gossip about you. They will always talk smack about you. Never for a moment think that an unbeliever ever thinks highly of you. That's foolishness. That's being naive. To think that this world can be your friend. Because just think about it. About how much you struggle to think positively of your fellow brother all the time. Right? If you have that much struggle, even with the indwelling of, your, of the Spirit of God, how much more will an unbeliever have against you? And when you give that indication, you start saying, uh, I was reading Jonathan Edwards' um, resolution and he says i resolve myself never to say anything bad about anyone and it struck me the moment you say a slanderous remark about anyone you are being a what a fool because it says here again do verse 17 on account of this do not be what foolish so wasting time is being foolish. Being drunk is being foolish. Being bitter is being foolish. Lying. Okay? Lay aside your former manner of, of deceit. Speak truth in verse 24. Put on the new man. Verse 25. Therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth to one another. When you come up with a lie to get out of a situation, you are seeing foolishness come, coming out. Wickedness. And if you haven't understood this part, verse um, 28, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Do you know what foolishness is? Foolishness is when you work to serve yourself and your family only. Because that's what the world does. Single guys, bachelors, they literally work to just feed themselves. If they give to charity, it's because they want tax deductions. That's, that's it. The Bible says, work to serve 
those in need in the ministry. Now that's just in Ephesians. But do you remember what Jesus said? Turn to Matthew 6. And now you realize, basically every command in Scripture is about how not to be a fool. One of the things that foolish people do in this world is worry. Worry about what? Material possessions. Verse 25, for this reason, I say to you, do not be fools and what? Worry. It's implied there. Why are you worrying? Okay, now, he didn't say the word fool here, but look at the sarcasm. Look at the rhetoric, right? For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I mean, he could have just stopped there. Is not life more than just eating, drinking, and putting on something fancy? There are people who literally live to put on clothing. It's all about what you wear. It's all about what you look like. So vain. It's so vain. And so what Jesus does is this. I'm going to give an example to show you how foolish you are. Verse 26, look at the birds. Look, they don't sow. You don't see them getting together and sowing the ground, you know, saving up their little, you know, seeds. I need to build a barn for this to keep it for next summer. They do not reap, nor gather into barns, and yet, notice, your Father in heaven, your heavenly Father, feeds them. And then he says, you fool. Okay, I know, he doesn't say that, but you got to hear it, right? Are you not much more than a bird? A bird. You're so worried. And Jesus says, God takes care of birds. Aren't you worth more than a bird? Yeah, but I don't know if God will, you know. Excuse me. Why are you being so what? Foolish. And then look at verse 27. It's like he's adding on to the you are a fool list here. Why are a who of you being worried can add? a single cubit to his lifespan. A cubit is about an arm's length like this. You want to add this much more to your life. You fool, right? You can't. Verse 28, Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? I can't help right now but think of how the Lord provided John for me. This belongs to John. And when Brittany worked at, was it? Banana Republic or somewhere, Gap, some J. Crew, whatever. She was able to get employee discount. And, you know, as I look back, I just envied a little bit. Like, man, John got so much good clothes. He always looks nice. His older brother, same old t-shirt, same old Costco V-neck. You know, five black shirts for Monday through Friday. But guess what? John had to lose weight by God's grace. Sovereignty. No, John, I'm sorry, John gained weight. Couldn't fit into this anymore. And had a whole box of these, like 50 shirts or something. And at first, he he gave it to Leo. He's like, what about me? And Leo's like, it doesn't fit, so he gave it to me. And now, my my closet, I dress better than Solomon in all of his glory. (laughs) I'm a living, breathing example of God providing nice clothes. Not a single cent was spent. Okay, do you guys see the folly here without Jesus saying the word folly? You guys are so foolish to think like this. Now, there's other ways. I'm just going to give you some uh, 
uh, general stuff. Wasting money on selfish gain. Luke 15, the prodigal son, he wasted his money on prostitutes and eating and drinking. Oversleeping. <clears throat> Some of you. Okay, Proverbs 20, verse 13. Do not love sleep or you will become poor. <laughs> Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with food. Number three, overindulging in food and whatever activity. Proverbs 23, verses 19 to 21. You, my son, listen and be wise. Direct your heart in the way. Do not be heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. I know. What, what do we do on Wednesday, Tuesday? <laughs> okay. That's just once. Okay. For heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe them with rags. Overeating, oversleeping, overspending your money. Four, engaging in activity that does not bear fruit for God. That's in Ephesians 5.11 where Paul says, Do not participate in unfruitful works of darkness. Five, overly worrying. Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and petition. Let your request be made known to God. Matthew 6, 33-34, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And number six, concern for some recognition by men. Think about this for a moment. Concern for some recognition by men or some achievement. Every time I see like a video of some people doing some stupid dance, it all I can see is they just want attention, some accomplishment, some kind of like, oh, I'm 46 and I can do the pistol squat. Things like that. I'm like, so what? And then I realized I did that in front of my little kids, you know? We all have a desire to be known. It is a fleshly um, desire in us. Do you guys remember 1 John 2, 15, uh, 2, 16 and 17? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of what? Life? There's a, there's a sinful desire in us to be known. To, to somehow boast about what we've done and what we are and who we, who we were and what now we're like this. And, the, and, and John says in verse 17, the world is passing away with all of its lust. Meaning all the desire to be known and acknowledged by men, all of that means absolutely what? Nothing. In fact, this is how Paul says in the first Corinthians chapter 8, verses 2 to 3, if anyone thinks he has known anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he has been known by Him. You have choice. You have two choices. Either be acknowledged by men or be acknowledged by who? By God. And that's why it says in 2 Timothy 3, 2, men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, All of these are foolishness. Wasting money, oversleeping, overindulging, engaging in activity that doesn't bear fruit, overly worrying, concern for some self-achievement. All of these things are the foolish ways of this world. And the Bible says, let's go back to Ephesians 5, do not be what? Foolish. Do not be foolish. Verse 17. But what? Verse 17, on account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the, of the Lord is. The phrase understand is a command. It is an imperative. That's why we see that this section is all about submission because it's all imperatives. Speak to one another in Psalms. That's an imperative. Rejoice. That's an imperative. Give thanks. That's an imperative. Be subject to one another. It's an imperative. It's just command, command, command. The Holy Spirit wants you to submit to Him. 
And here, the command is for you to understand. Isn't that interesting? He's, it's, he commands you to understand. Start understanding now. That's what he's saying. Understand what the will of the Lord is. The phrase, the lema, to kurio, master. Understand the will of your master. He commands you, but you do not know what he's saying. That's what Paul is implying. God is calling you to do his bidding, and yet you are being a fool and not understanding. If, if you want to know God's will and you want to understand it, He will help you understand. John seven seventeen says this, If anyone is willing to do His will, he will know about the teaching, whether it is of God or I speak for myself. Turn with me to James chapter 1. You might say, well, I want to understand, but what do I do? Study the Bible? and Yes, that's part of it, but the first is simply asking Him. Ask Him. Seek Him. Be willing. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without what? Reproach. I mean, He's not going to find fault with you. He's not going to say, oh, finally you're asking for wisdom. When you come before Him eagerly seeking to do His will, to understand, He will grant that grace and help you to give you that wisdom. But look at verse 6. But He must ask in faith, doubting nothing, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. The English is kind of strange to understand. You're like, doubt? Well, I'm not doubting Him. He's saying, do not be double-minded in your commitment to Him. You want wisdom to do His will? Make sure your heart is fully what? Set. Whatever He gives me to do, I will what? Do. Now the question is then, what exactly is the will of God? Okay. <clears throat> Here it is. Now you want to look at it in two ways, okay? In two ways. There's what we call the general principle of God's will. Okay? The general will of God. Like generally, number one, God, God desires or God's will is that everyone be saved. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about His promise as some consider slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to what? Repentance. Okay, so generally, salvation is really the first thing you need to do to have to be in the will of God. He desires all men to be what? Saved. Okay? So, I guess if you want to say this, what's the first thing I must do to be in the will of God? Be saved. Repent, be baptized, join a church, be saved. But number two, generally, God's will is that you be pure. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians. I mean, it says it right there. So, you know, the Bible has several of these phrases, the will of God, and it's very clear what the will of God is. But again, these are general wills, meaning this is not the will where he'll tell you, you know, go work at Walmart, okay? Or go take that test and pass at Walmart. Or, I don't know, I'm just thinking about that person right there, okay? Right? You know, um, Walmart has great plans if you work there. That's good insurance. Good. Yeah. Anyways, okay. First Thessalonians chapter 4, okay. It says, this is the will of God. Look at verse 3. There it is. This is God's will. Your what? Sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel, meaning your body. It is God's will that you learn to control your flesh. Do you see that? Purity is God's will, controlling your body, meaning don't do what your body wants to what? To do. It wants to sleep in five more minutes, refuse it. Okay? It wants to eat one more slice of pie, stop. Okay? Or you become diabetic. 
or pre-diabetic. Meaning, you got to learn to be controlling yourself rather, rather than just do whatever your body wants you to do. So, be, being saved is God's will. Being sanctified and self-controlled is God's will. Number three, it is God's will that you suffer. Like what? It is God's will that you suffer. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Yes, it is God's will that you be blessed with His grace and blessed with suffering. Suffering is the will of God. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, it says, For this you have been called. Do you guys see that? You've been called to this. Called to what? Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his what? In his steps. When Jesus spoke the truth, he was persecuted and he suffered. He wants you to do the same. There's other parts, not just in persecution, but in other ways of suffering. Paul says, you know, I've been in dangers from robbers, dangers from rivers, like robbers and rivers. It has nothing to do with who he was. He wasn't preaching the gospel. He was just traveling. He got robbed. He's just crossing a river and the river just overflooded everything. He almost drowned. That's what he's saying. He spent several nights shipwrecked on the ocean. Was that his fault? No. He's saying it's part of being a believer to go through traumatic suffering. We call it unfortunate events, right? But it is God who brought it into your life. Car accidents, tire, whatever, illnesses. Understand, it is God's will that you suffer. So if you're suffering, you should not be saying, am I in the will of God? The answer is obviously, yes, you are in His what? In His will. And again, it's not going to be pleasant. But when Christ suffered at the hands of men, was it ever pleasant? And fourthly, it is God's will that you, you be thankful. Now, we saw that in the beginning, but I just want to show you another verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because this one says it is God's will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, in everything, in everything, give thanks. And look at the phrase, for this is God's what? Will. Okay? In everything. It's God's will. So if you're asking, how do I know I'm in the will of God? I want to be right there where God wants me to be. The first question you want to ask is, am I being thankful? Because it seems like by asking that question, you don't sound very what? Thankful. So I guess you're not in the will of God now. So turn and be thankful. Be thankful that you have no idea what to do with your life. Because now maybe you can get on your knees and start trusting what? In Him. Sometimes God puts us in these weird situations where it's going so bad. And then you realize that the result of that was you getting on your knees and actually crying out. You would have never prayed that much had you not gone through that, what? Unfortunate event in your life. So be thankful. Now, going back to Ephesians, however, when Paul says, understand what the will of the Lord is, he's not referring to the general things. He's actually referring to those particular things in your life. The decision to marry this person versus that person. The decision to go to this school versus that school. The decision to go take this job or that job. The decision to buy this color car or that color car. Like all of these decisions that you have to make, Paul is saying, understand his will. Okay? You, you need to apply this. MacArthur says this, The will of which Paul seems to be speaking here is the Lord's specific leading of individual believers. Now, again, just as an example, we're not saying that, you know, you're praying sincerely, should I buy this red bike or this purple bike? 
You know, you're just like, oh God, and you start. It, 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 I'm not saying like God's gonna like open, like give you a revelation on that, but the the emphasis here to the Ephesians is you're not thinking about this like you should. You're you're not concerned every day what the will of God is as you ought to be doing. And if it comes to the point of even saying, Lord, give me wisdom of, of deciding between this or that, you need to start. Meaning these people began to just live. They just got up and just went about their day and lived. And Paul is commanding them, stop just living. Stop just letting the day go by, you know, over, sl- wake up, sleep, I mean, wake up, work, sleep, wake up, work, sleep. Understand what God's will is. Now, to do this, you have to know what the general will of God is. The general ones that we just went over, but also he's referring to everything that he's mentioned in Ephesians so far. Things like, number one, it is God's will to display his glory in history, through the church with Jesus Christ as the what? Head. That's in chapter 1. So, if that's God's will to use the church in history to display His glory with Jesus Christ as the head, what do you think you need to do? What do you think you need to understand about your life? You need to understand it is God's will for you particularly to get involved in the what? In the church. And build the church Chapter 3, verse 10, it says, The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. If that's God's will for the church, understand your will then. I mean, understand His will for you. What specific things do you now have to do when you want to go and spend that $100 on that whatever it is, that thing you want to buy? Is it going to help build a ministry in the church? Do you guys see what's going on? It's not so much, Lord, is it the red thing or the blue thing? Is it going to be this house on this street or that house in that city? It's making those decisions under the umbrella of the church is His glory. So I'm going to, if I'm going to choose house A versus house B, I'm going to ask this question. It's God's will that I build up the church. This house is closer to the church. It's more accessible. It can be there for Bible studies. This must be the will of what? God. Do you you guys understand? You start deciding with that perspective. It's not just, oh, does this house have better air conditioning? Or this 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 place doesn't have HOA. I'm going to go there. It's not that. that's, That's worldliness. You're choosing based on pragmatism. What what benefits you? When you choose, you want to benefit what? The body of Christ. Why? The church throughout the history is going to sum up all things in Christ with Jesus Christ as the head. If that's how God is going to do life, then I want to do everything for His glory in the ministry. There's so many other verses. Chapter 1, verse 21, right? His power, authority, dominion, every name, every, every name that is named, only, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, he put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. Ephesians 2, 2 7, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, 8 through 10, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to me to proclaim the, to the Gentiles the good news of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. When Paul says in chapter 5, understand what the will of the Lord is, he's saying, do you not realize what you're doing with your life is out of the will of God if you're not building up the church? If your whole life is not swept up, integrated into the ministry, you are not understanding the will of God. 
marriage. Who do you want to marry? When I was looking at Pauline, okay, that doesn't come out right. Okay, when I was checking her out, you know, you know what I was looking at? I know she was very beautiful, be be very beautiful, very, 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 very beautiful. Okay. What caught my eyes was that she was always there for evangelism. What caught my eyes was that after she got saved, she really took notes and asked the right questions. She wasn't emotional like other women. She wasn't very, she didn't gossip for sure. And I said, this is perfect for the ministry. That was it. That's the only reason why I married her. Okay. And maybe she might be good for producing a lot of babies, but you know, Yeah, just the right one. That's what you guys can share that whisper there. Okay? That's literally it. And I want you guys to follow that example. Do not choose based on looks, charisma, or riz, if you want to use today's term. Okay? Right? Do not choose based on that. Okay? Will he love me? Will he will she cook will she cook me all you know all these fancy meals? Guys, for the first year I suffered. But the Lord blessed that suffering. Okay? Give her way, so much wisdom on how to cook. Okay? The point is, everything you do, everything, mm -hmm. the, understand what the will of the Lord is. Number two, God's will is that you be grounded in the love of Christ. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. When Paul says, understand what the will of the Lord is, he's saying, understand how much He loves you. He truly loves you. And let that be the most amazing part of your life. Not even so much that you have a wife who loves you or your children who loves you. It's that Jesus Christ loves you. And number three, God's will is that you learn to properly function in the body. Chapter 4 verse 1. When it says understand God's will, it's this. I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk in a worthy manner of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does God want you to do with whatever it is you're deciding to do with your life? It's to be humble and loving and understanding of the people in the church and maintaining unity. Being mature, useful. Verse 11, He gave some to be apostles, some as prophets. Why? To equip you. And in verse 13, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, which belongs to the fullness of Christ, not to be like children tossed here and there by waves. Whatever it is you're deciding to do, ask yourself this question. By doing this, am I functioning properly in the body of Christ? You guys see how this works now? If you put away all of this and just ask, what does God want me to do? It's going to be silent. Lord, do you want me to do this or go here? He's not going to speak. Why? It doesn't pertain to His actual what? will in life. Does that make sense? So whenever you ask, what is God's you know, particular will for me? You know, what does He want me to do? Well, you got to place it on this grid. Be humble, loving, be maturing, okay? Maintain the unity of the church, number four, okay? It is God's will that you stop acting like the world. And that's what we find in verse chapter 4. But you'll notice now, as we come to that passage in verse 17 in chapter 5, you know, understand what the will of the Lord is. It just goes right back to everything that we already, what, 
mention. And you know what that means? It means unless you keep reviewing, you will not get it right. Do you understand? Unless you keep reviewing what you're supposed to be thinking of, you're, you will no longer be able to discern every day what it is to discern the will of God, to be pleasing to Him. Stop acting like the world. Number five, God's to live, stop living deceitfully. Number six, stop being angry. Number seven, work to serve others. We covered that. Number eight, speak to edify. And number nine, be under the complete control of the Spirit. Once you keep all of that in mind, every time you act and talk and think and decide, it's always going to be through that grid and you will now know what exactly God wants you to do. Now, as, as a warning, okay? The worst way of discerning God's will is this. And I know you are, you're, all of us are guilty of this. The worst way of discerning God's will is to do something and then see what happens after. You're looking for a result. Because you're thinking, if it's God's will, it should turn out what? Right or good. Okay? All of us are guilty of that. That is the, the worst way of, of discerning the will of God. Because if it turns out right, it might not be the will of God. If it turns out wrong, it might be the will of God. Let me show you. Turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3. This is after Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 37 to 39. It says, who is there who speaks and it happens? You see that? Unless the Lord commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good go forth? Why should any living person or any man complain because of his sins? That passage makes it clear. Good things come from God and calamities also what? come from God. So you can't determine God's will based on some kind of an outcome. It's the worst way. And this is called pragmatism. Pragmatism is a lazy way of trying to discern the will of God. It's lazy because you don't want to think about Scripture and its principles and all that's covered in Ephesians 1-5. through You just want to decide on the spot what you think God's will might be. And then you wait. To see what would happen. Oh, something great happened. Must be the will of God. And you walk and you, you know, skip down the road thinking it is and God is frowning. You fool. It displeased me. And you're walking joyfully when you should be repenting. Okay. Pragmatism is when we refuse to study the scripture and memorize the principle and just do what we think is right and then we watch for a good result. That pragmatistic idea is ultimately, again, foolishness or rebellion against God. Why? Because we don't want to take time and study the scripture and get our mind in the word of God. And all of us are guilty of this. And we have to stop. So going back to chapter 4. I'm chapter 5. Do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. And next time we meet. We're going to look at verse 18. So do not get drunk with what? Wine. Now, we're going to talk about drinking in detail. And the conclusion of that will be, none of us should ever take a cup of alcohol. Now, we're going to clarify all of that. Because I know some people will say things like, well, the Bible doesn't condemn drinking. It just condemns drunkenness. 
But I will show you from the scripture that there's enough there to make it clear that if you don't have to, you must not. Okay, let's pray. Father, we desire to know your will about all of these things. And thank you for helping us to see that we've been guilty of pragmatism. We're trying to discern your will just pragmatically without thinking about your word and conforming to the blueprint of your word. Father, help us to remember and cause us, Lord, to discipline ourselves to review, to memorize, to reflect and meditate on the principles that are found so clearly in the scripture and if nothing else, in the book of Ephesians in the first four chapters. Father, help us, Lord, that every day we might discern how to live for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand together as we sing. <laughs>